Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Society presents this is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Big Breakout. All criminals suffer from the same organic disorder, enlargement of the ego, and sooner or later it proves fatal to their career of crime. For as an ancient thinker once said, he is most vulnerable who believes himself invincible. For some criminals, one heavy prison sentence is enough to deflate their ego. But in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, Earl Dixon accepted his first set of prison bars not as a defeat, but as a great opportunity to prove himself smarter than the law. In a Midwestern penitentiary, Dixon, serving a term for hijacking, and two fellow inmates are seated in their cell after the evening meal. Cigarette, gentlemen? Rock? Oh, thanks, Dixie. Louis? Yeah, if that's the best you can do, Dixie. Of course, I'm used to lighting a corona after a pheasant. You're dinner, used to but... talking too much, Louis. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep the art of chatter alive in our little home. Rock is a man of action rather than words, Louis. Well, you ain't exactly the gabby type yourself, Dixie. I've been interested in only one subject since matriculating here. <laughs> but you uh, ain't talking about it, huh? I never talk on a subject until I'm qualified by research. And when'll that be? No. Oh, yeah? <laughs> then what's the title of your subject? Escape. Escape? Shut up, Louis. Are you gentlemen interested? Gee, Dixie, I don't know. I only got three more years here. Just the weekend, huh, Louis? No, no, it's not that, but guys can get shot trying something like that. I wonder what your girl is doing tonight, Louis. Yeah, what do you mean? Just curious. Well, I know what she better not be doing. What's that got to do with it? Three years is a long time to sit and wonder. Maybe it'll be too late after that. Uh, what about you, Rob? Count me in, Dixie. Good. We'll make it a twosome there. I don't know. Wait a minute. Yes, Louis. What did you really mean about my Dane? I told you. Three years is a long time. Oh, she better not pull no double deal on me. <laughs> I'm in. Splendid. What's the gimmick, Dixie? A 
Well, the doctor is on duty in the hospital until 11 o'clock. Yeah. He lives outside, drives home when his relief comes. Yeah. Lights out in here at 9. The turnkey makes a round of inspection at 10. Uh-huh. Tonight when he comes around, you... Hospital ward, Dr. Wilson. Oh, hello, Evelyn. Yes, honey, I'll be on my way home in about ten minutes. As soon as Dr. Blaney comes in to relieve me. Huh? Oh, sure, sure, I'll bring some. Okay. Bye, sugar. Uh, what are you doing in here? People watch that door, Louie. Okay. Doctor's about your size, Rock. His jacket should fit you rather neatly. Just so it helps me drive us through the gate okay. Here you are. You do it quickly now. Yeah. I'll take a look outside. Everything's all right, boys. Come on. Quietly, please. All right. This is his car. Take the wheel, Rock. The way and I'll crouch on the floor right behind you. Okay. All right. Make for the gate. Keep your head down. Uh, don't worry. I want to keep it. Okay, Doc. I'll open the gate. I'm leaving kind of early to... Hey, wait a minute. You're not the doc. <laughs> Rock's head. I'll grab the wheel. Pull Rock over. Okay. Did you make it? Yes. Hey, Rock's head bad, Dixie. Really? Yeah, what, what can we do for him? Throw him out. Huh? I said throw him out. But he's still alive. Do as I say. Okay. Sorry, Rock. <clears throat> Gee, I hated to do that. Consider yourself fortunate. It could easily have been you. What do you mean? I had anticipated that whoever drove the car would get killed. After the jailbreak had been accomplished and the convicts had made a successful getaway, the penitentiary warden immediately contacted the nearest office of the FBI just across the state line, where Special Agent Connor took the call. Gray Pontiac, two-door sedan. License number? Seven, five, four, six. All right, I've got it. Which direction was it going when it left the penitentiary? Thanks, Warden. We'll get on it right away. Jailbreak, Fred? Yes, three made the break, but one got killed. Who were the other two? Take the names. Uh-huh. Earl Dixon and Louis Muncie. Louis Muncie. I've got him. While I'm getting out an alarm, you contact Washington and ask them to teletype all information they have on Dixon and Muncie. In Dayton, Ohio, a few hours after the prison break, two men walked quietly along a fog-shrouded street. They stopped in front of a modest apartment building. A minute later, a young girl occupying a ground-floor apartment was aroused by the insistent sound of the door buzzer. Just a minute. Oh. I'm coming. Who is it? Open the door. <gasps> Earl. Hello, sis. Earl, I... Go in, Louis. Okay. What are you... Be quiet. Lower that window shade, please, Louis. All right. Earl, what are you doing here? Okay, Louis. Yeah, all right. What are you doing here? How did you get out of prison? Quite cleverly. I escaped. Oh. It was a very monotonous life. I needed to change. Well, you don't seem very happy to see me. I'm not. Now, I ask you, Louis, is that, isn't that a shocking admission for one's own sister? Yeah. Oh, by the way, Annette, allow me to present my fellow Houdini, Louis Muncie. Pleased to know you. Why did you come here? Seemed a natural thing to do. Earl, you can't stay. Now, Annette. I mean it. You've got to leave here at once. Hey, what is this? I thought she was okay. She will be. Earl, listen to me. In the past, I've always weakened and tried to help you. Always thinking maybe you'd straighten out. 
But this time it's different. I'm not harboring any criminals. I'm staying, Annette. Oh, no, you're not. Where are you going? I'm calling the police. Hey, now, wait a minute. Hold it, Louis. What are you going to tell them, Annette? That you're turning your brother in? That you want him sent back to prison? Yes. Then I'd better acquaint you with just what that would mean. A man was killed when we escaped. Oh. Now, my dear, could you make us some coffee? Is that teletype from Washington, Fred? Yes, with the dope on Dixon and Muncie. What does it say? It looks like Dixon was the brains behind the break. Yes? College education and always boasting how much smarter he is than the law. What was he in for? Hijacking. Uh-huh. He was sentenced in federal court. Suspected of a killing, too, but there wasn't enough evidence to pin it on him. What about Muncie? They're just finishing up on him now. Here. Here we are. Muncie seems to be a kind of a stooge in a gang that was mixed up in hijacking, too. He'd probably stick with Dixon, then, for guidance. I wouldn't be surprised. Any reports on the fugitives while I was out? No. Mm, They could be clear out of the state by this time. Yes, that makes them our game more than ever. Any leads on Dixon and that stuff from Washington? I was just looking it over. It says Dixon lived with his sister in Cincinnati just before he was sent up. You know, he might make for there again. Mm, wouldn't that be an obvious move? Well, since Dixon considers himself smarter than the law, he might think the obvious thing to do would be least expected. Let's get Cincinnati on the phone. We'll tell him not to wait until daylight to check up, but go out right now and keep a watch on her address. Right. Remember this piece, Annette? How I used to slave to learn it. As I recall, it was Mother's favorite... Stop, Bill, please. What's the matter? The difference between then and now, I... I don't want to think of it. Dear Annette, always the sentimentalist. Earl. Yes? How long is this going to go on? What? This staying here. Oh. Oddly enough, I was just thinking about that. Police are bound to come here sometime. You saw the morning paper. They're combing three states looking for you. I know. Oh, please, won't you give yourself up? Oh, stop being childish. What else can you do? I have a very definite plan in mind. You're right about their eventually coming here, but when they arrive, we'll be gone. What do you mean? We still have that little houseboat on the Ohio River. Yes. Then I think we should use it. We? Yes. You and I. Oh, no, please. I'll need you, Annette. You'll have to drive. Oh, why can't you leave me alone? It's very pleasant, like a vacation. Vacation with two murderers. Oh, I forgot to mention my good companion, Mr. Muncie, who sleeps so peacefully in your bedroom, will not be with us. Do you intend to leave him here? Not exactly. I don't understand. Well, he has already served his purpose. Where you are see, you, it... folks? Oh. Greetings, Louis. Well, I was just talking about you. Oh, yeah? Yes, I was telling my sister that we are going to take a little trip. Oh, blowing out of here? Yes. Where are we going? Well, unfortunately, Louis, you're not really coming along. What do you mean? I needed you for the getaway just as I needed Rock, but now your usefulness has ended. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, Louis. Oh. 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 Darling. He'll be with us in spirit. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the FBI file on the big breakout. We will return to this case in just a moment. Let's look at America through the eyes of a G.I. just back from the Pacific. He's flying cross-continent to his home in the east. And perhaps he's wondering what sort of job he'll land when he takes off his uniform. 
Well, no matter what route his army transport plane follows, at some time in almost every hour of the flight, he's looking down on places where equitable society investments are helping to provide jobs for ex-servicemen. Whether his plane soars over the cattle-studded plains of Texas or the waving wheatlands of Minnesota, over the cornfields of Iowa or the tobacco plantations of Kentucky, equitable society dollars are right there, soundly invested with progressive American farmers to promote farm prosperity. Or take practically any industrial center in which his plane might land. Take Chicago or Detroit, Cleveland or Pittsburgh, these also are centers for the investment of equitable society funds in steel mills and mines, in railroads and shipyards, in textile mills and industrial plants of all kinds. Yes, with equitable society dollars at work in every section of the country, and with the equitable society's three and a quarter million members living in every state in the Union, this great mutual organization is well named the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. For since 1859, equitable society dollars have helped make the whole United States the land of opportunity. Yes, by serving its members for 86 years, the equitable society has served America. And now back to the file on the big breakout. FBI agents make no pretense of infallibility. And although highly trained in their profession of criminal investigation, things happen so fast at times that human judgment is bound to err in one step or another in their investigative procedure. But this they have never failed to do. Readjust. The long hours of the day have dragged past. And now darkness is falling. Earl Dixon sits with his sister in the living room of her apartment. Who's that? How do I know? See who it is. I'll stand just behind the door. And don't let anyone in. Understand? Very well. Good evening. Good evening. You're Miss Annette Dixon, are you not? Yes. I'm Special Agent Connor of the FBI. The FBI? Yes. We just learned that you had moved here from Cincinnati. But, but why are you interested in where I live? The automobile in which your brother escaped from prison last night was found early today, abandoned just outside of town. May I come in? But, but my brother isn't here. Then there's no reason why I shouldn't come in, is there? No, that is, Thank I... Thank you. I have a gun what? here, Mr. Connor. Uh, I've often wanted to match wits with the FBI. Don't reach for yours. I wouldn't have any wits left for you to match if I did. I was sure they trained you to be practical. Yes. That's one of the reasons we usually win, Dixon. Have you always won until now? I wouldn't say that now is exactly over. You fellows travel in pairs. Is your partner outside in the car? No. I came here alone. Where is your partner? I'm afraid you'll have to proceed without that knowledge. He and your office must have known you came here. You think so? Yes. In that event, I think you'd better come along with us. Where to? My sister and I are taking a little trip. You'd be a very welcome companion. Really? Yes. With an FBI agent driving us in an FBI car, we should find it rather a safe journey. At your service, Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Oh, by the way... You wouldn't mind transporting a corpse, too, would you? It would be rather awkward leaving him here. Louis Muncy? That's right. Bring him along. I'd be very glad to have his body as evidence of murder against you. What makes you think you'll be able to produce this evidence? This was to be a match of wits, remember? <laughs> When Special Agent Connor did not return to Dayton Police Headquarters within the designated time to rejoin his partner, Special Agent Whitman, Whitman and a police officer drove to Miss Dixon's address. 
Whitman is now returning to the car. There's something funny about this, Sergeant. I saw you go inside after you got no answer. I found this on the floor in the living room. What is it? Connor's wallet. What? And dresser drawers had been pulled open like somebody had packed and left in a hurry. Well. I'd say Connor ran into Dixon, all right. And possibly Muncie, too. And he dropped his wallet to let you know he'd been here and something was wrong. Yes. With his car gone, that means only one thing. Let's put out an alarm on that car. This is such a pleasure. The rolling fields, the green trees. You know, I've looked at penitentiary walls so long I'd forgotten this even existed. Isn't it lovely, Annette? Please don't talk to me. (laughs) My sister doesn't approve of me, Mr. Connor. I'd say she has excellent taste. Uh, Poor Louis. Poor Louis would have enjoyed this so. Which reminds me, I've decided not to dispose of his body anywhere along the way. Really? The river will be a much better place. Bodies have a disconcerting way of rising to the surface. Not when they're properly weighted, Mr. Connor. Oh. And that should offer a cue to your own fate. Thank you. Too bad you won't be able to enjoy a weekend on our little houseboat. You'd like to have his company, wouldn't you, Annette? Please, Earl. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? Car trouble. Accidental, of course. What other kind is there? That sounds like a flooded carburetor. What have you done to it? The car stalled. Would you like to get out and diagnose the trouble yourself? You'd like that, wouldn't you? You go ahead and fix it, and I'm warning you. If you take too long... I won't, I assure you. Why don't we get some word, Sergeant? Well, we've done everything we can, Mr. Whitman. Something should come in. Well, that's the toughest thing about this business. I'm waiting. I know. They must have taken Connor along as cover. If they did, Connor's driving the car. We put all that in the alarm. Is there any more background on the Dixon family? Any place he'd be likely to go to? Mm, I'm having that checked now. In the meantime, the clock is running out. They're running out fast. I'll get it. Police headquarters, Sergeant Gillen speaking. Yes? Yes? Where was this? Just a minute, Mr. Whitman. Yes. This is state police. They got something on Connor. Uh, Let me talk to them, please. Sure, here you are. Hello? This is Special Special Agent Whitman speaking. What have you got? I see. Uh, Will you read it, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Sergeant. We've got a definite lead on Connor. I just hope we're not too late. Where did my sister go, Connor? Into the houseboat. Oh. I guess you've got Muncie's body weighted sufficiently now. Enough to keep it from drifting. That'll make it easier for us to locate. Us? Mm Mm-hmm. I admire your optimism. Now, if you will just drag the body out onto the deck. There, that will do nicely. And now I'll ask you to hoist it over the side. You're really running up a big score, Dixon. Just remember this gun. Go ahead, Connor. Okay. And now I suggest that we return to the cabin. Go ahead. After you, Mr. Connor. Thanks. Annette. Annette, will you stop that crying? Leave her alone. Well... Sir Galahad. Will you have a drink? No, thanks. Then I guess we'd better pass on to the next item on the program. That turns out to be you, Mr. Connor. Earl, Earl, you can't... Hold it, miss. Dixon. Yes? You said this was to be a match of wits. That's right. And it's been rather unbalanced in my favor, wouldn't you say? No, I wouldn't. What do you mean? You had that pistol on me all evening. But it didn't keep me from working. Working? 
You didn't see me drop my wallet on the floor of your sister's apartment back in Dayton, did you? Now, don't pull I that. I saw it. What? Annette, why didn't you... I left it there because I knew my partner would find it very shortly and know something was wrong. Look, Connor... I'm just trying to get my wits on the record. Very well. And you were right in suspecting I caused the car trouble back on the highway. All you gained was time, if you did. No. I left a note under a tool when I was under the car. It must have been picked up by now. And what did the note say? That we were coming here. Well, that makes you almost even. I'd say that puts me a little bit ahead. Annette, I think we're getting out of here. I hate to keep piling up points, Dixon, but the keys to the car are in the river with Muncie's body. Why, you... Now, don't be a bad loser, Dixon. I haven't lost. Oh, no? Look at that car coming along the riverbank. Where? Thank heaven. Is it the police? It isn't even a car. That was an old trick, Miss Dixon. But I won the match. Earl Dixon was returned to the penitentiary and subsequently tried and convicted for the murder of his fellow convict. Like all criminals, Dixon had an inflated estimation of his own ability to beat the law. And this was one of the most effective contributing factors to his inevitable downfall. No one is smarter than the law. Sooner or later, this inescapable fact is known to all criminals. We'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week, at the Equitable Society, I was shown three checks that were ready to go out in the afternoon mail. One was the biggest check I've ever seen in my life. A six, followed by six zeros. A six million dollar investment of Equitable Society funds in a great industrial concern which will employ several thousand men many of them returning servicemen. The second check was for $16,000, a loan to a farmer in Iowa who came to his equitable society so that he could buy a piece of land he's had his eye on for many years. The third check was for $6,000, and it was going to help an ex-sergeant of the Marines buy that little house he dreamed about while he lay in a hospital recovering from wounds received on Guadalcanal. Now he's going to own that little home with the aid of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. And there you have three of the principal ways in which Equitable Society dollars are put to work. In promoting home ownership. In lending farmers a helping hand. In keeping the wheels of industry turning. That's why we think this life insurance business we're in is a good business. We collect premium dollars from our members for their good and then invest them in ways that are good for the entire nation. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next Friday, December 7th, is the fourth anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Our program that evening will present a thrilling and factual account of the FBI's work on that momentous day. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. 
Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight, we bring you a special FBI presentation commemorating the fourth anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stretching tonight from the quiet meadows of France, the hillsides of Italy, and across the sands of North Africa to the jungle islands of the Pacific are gardens of little white crosses where almost 275,000 American boys lie in eternal condemnation of that day four years ago which will live forever in infamy. Sunday, December 7th, 1941 the day that Japan stabbed America in the back at Pearl Harbor. But long before Pearl Harbor plunged us into global war with them, the Axis nations through their agents in this country were plotting and working against the internal security of America, protected against the interference by those same principles of freedom they sought to destroy. Then, on September 3, 1939, Hitler began the murder of Poland, the first flame of world conflagration. America had to prepare her defenses and take aggressive steps to safeguard them. Three days after that ruthless invasion, Director J. Edgar Hoover of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, your FBI, assembled his staff in extraordinary session. Gentlemen, I have here a directive from the President of the United States. The Attorney General has been requested by me to instruct the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Justice, to take charge of investigative work in matters relating to espionage, sabotage, and violations of the neutrality regulations. This task must be conducted in a comprehensive and effective manner on a national basis, and all information must be carefully sifted out and correlated in order to avoid confusion and irresponsibility. To this end, I request all police officers, sheriffs, and all other law enforcement officers in the United States promptly to turn over to the nearest representative of the Federal Bureau of Investigation any information obtained by them relating to espionage, counterespionage, sabotage, subversive activities, and violations of the neutrality laws. Well, I know the Bureau is fully prepared for this undertaking, gentlemen, so we shall proceed to put it into action at once. That's all. Your FBI was ready, but it was nevertheless a mammoth undertaking. For on the day that the president's directive was put into force, 
Over 1,200,000 persons born in Germany were living in the United States. Nearly 85,000 foreign-born Japanese were living in the United States and Hawaii. Nearly every major city in America had large quotas of foreign-born Italians living among the American-born Italian populations. And thousands of special agents of the three Axis nations were actively at work throughout continental United States and all American territories. Ever since the rise of the pompous political criminal Benito Mussolini to the throne of dictator, Italian fascist societies had been at work in America, seeking first by propaganda, and when that failed, by brutal force, to convert American-born Italians to the service of Il Duce. And they didn't stop with threats. In a large eastern city one night, an elderly, gray-haired foe of fascism was preparing to leave his office when... All right, just stay put, Baroni. Yeah. Who are you men and what do you want here? You've been warned three times to stop talking against El Duce. Oh. So you have come to warn me again? No. This time we come to make you stop. What I have said about Mussolini and fascismo is the truth. I said we come to make you stop. What Mussolini and fascismo do in Italy, I cannot fight against. But I am an American citizen. And I can fight against what they are trying to do in my country. And I shall continue to fight against it. More insidious and of greater danger to the security of America than the work of fascist agents had been the operations of the foreign-born Japanese. Executed with oriental cunning and fanatical worship of their sacred son of heaven and behind a false face of friendship. For how often did we read or hear such words as... Japan has always considered America her greatest friend and it is the supreme desire of the government and the people of Japan to perpetuate peaceful relations between our two countries. But throughout the country and in Hawaii, Japanese Buddhist and Shinto priests preached the doctrine of absolute loyalty to the homeland. Japanese children learned that it was glorious to die for the emperor. Japanese consulates spread literature defending Japan's actions in China. Clues on Japanese fishing boats sounded at harbor depths and photographed defense installations. Japanese admirals and army officers posing as civilians gathered vital information on America's military strength and production capacity. Behind the locked doors of a ceremonial hall, the secret society known as the Rising Sun Order met quite often for this purpose. The candidates for membership will come forward. You will kneel before the sacred shrine. You will repeat the pledge now. I swear allegiance unto death to his imperial majesty, son of heaven and emperor of Japan, and declare that through unity of purpose and complete cooperation, we intend to show our friendship to our comrades at war and to express the great spirit to build up the Japanese Empire. As for Germany's part in the picture which now confronted your FBI, the Nazi party had been active in America as far back as 1926, eight years before Hitler at last became the Fuhrer. And through the ensuing years, it spread its tentacles until they reached into every stratum of American life. Nazi agents tried to work their way into all branches of American military and naval service and into the merchant marine. They were workers and even executives in our vital industries. They were editors, authors, and lecturers. They were landowners at strategic points along our Atlantic and Gulf Coast lines. They were merchants and bankers and lawyers and doctors. They were social leaders 
and Nazi sympathizers taught in our schools, preached in our churches, and got elected to public offices low and high as servants of the American people. And more than that, thousands of Nazi youth in America and their elders put on gray shirts and uniforms. And by day and by night, secluded valleys echoed with the goose-stepping of these fanatical legions. Then they boldly came out into the open, held public rallies, and one night, 20,000 Bundes jammed New York's Madison Square Garden. A day is speeding toward you when you will be called upon to contribute your part in building this new world. A world of order. A world rid of these corrupt peoples who have been a cancer on the advancement of civilization. I say that day is near at hand. Be prepared. Be strong. Be resolute. Be ready to smash the enemy. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! That was the picture that confronted your FBI on September 6, 1939. The day the president said, take defensive action. Director Hoover said, we are ready. And to his staff, go into action at once. Operator. Get me the Chicago field office. Operator. Get me the Boston field office. Operator? I want the Dallas field office. Denver. San Francisco. Honolulu. Within the space of a few minutes after Director Hoover had read the presidential directive to his staff, the nerve center of your FBI in Washington had transmitted the impulse for action along every thread of contact in the vast web of its organization. And soon, special agents were... Surveying America's defense plans and taking precautionary measures against sabotage. Setting up protection for America's transportation and communication systems. Watching the movements of Axis diplomatic officials using their immunity to carry on hostile operations and embarking on the widest spread spy hunt in the nation's history. But the biggest task of all was that of checking on all suspected Axis aliens and compiling dossiers on those who might become active enemy aliens. Day and night, from Seattle to Miami, from San Diego to Bangor, this work went on. In an Italian bar and grill... Don't talk us so loud. What do I care? When Mussolini gets in the war, it'll be all over in Europe. <laughs> You'll come over here. I beg and... your pardon. I'm huh? a special agent of the FBI. FBI. You an American citizen? Uh, sh- sure, I'm an American. You have an alien registration card? Well, I... Uh... I think you'd better come with me. In a rowboat one night in the murky waters lapping the pilings of a Jap fishing village on the west coast. I'm not mistaken, that secret radio receiver's in that shack over there. We can't raid the place. No. We can't tell them that's what we're looking for. All we need's a reaction. In a plane factory, turning out medium bombers for the British. Just a minute there. What is your name? Carl Wilson. Think again, I'm a special agent of the FBI. My name is Carl Wilson. Our records say that you were born in Germany, entered this country illegally, and your name is Carl Schmidt. Come with me. Twenty-four hours around the clock, seven days a week, the checkup went on throughout the 48 states and territories of the United States. The checkup and all other parts of the vast program of defensive action, with the result that FBI agents were able to report 2,300 defense plants surveyed and protected against sabotage. Railroads, airlines, harbors, bus lines, and vital inland waterways protected against sabotage. 
Coordination of all local and state law enforcement agencies with the FBI into one internal defense unit ready for any national emergency. All potentially dangerous Axis aliens cataloged and whereabouts known at all times. Complete record of activities of all Axis diplomatic officials in the United States. And all 42 members of two German spy rings taken into custody. Yes, by the summer of 1941, the President's directives had been carried out in full. America's internal security was protected. There remained only the important job of keeping a constant vigil. And this your FBI did during the remainder of the summer, through the fall... And this it was still doing when... It was another Sunday in America. Christmas was hardly more than two weeks away. But still the people were following their usual Sunday habits. In some parts it was time to go to church. Elsewhere it was Sunday dinner time. Some were playing golf, driving in the countryside, visiting friends, seeing movies or dozing in a big chair at home. In the telephone switchboard room of the FBI in Washington, the operators on duty took care of routine calls. Then, a yellow light glowed on panel number six. Washington. This is the agent in charge in Honolulu. I want to speak to Mr. Hoover. Right away, sir. Yes? Honolulu calling, Mr. Hoover. Put them on. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Honolulu. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Japanese planes are bombing Pearl Harbor. What? Listen, you can hear the bombs exploding. We will return to our FBI file in just a moment. Meanwhile... Look over our shoulders while we open some of the mail that arrives at the Equitable Society every day from your neighbors and, who knows, maybe from yourself. It's a very good thing for a man to be happy in his work, to feel that his job benefits others as well as himself. Well, that's the way we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States feel about our jobs. You see, Equitable Society members think of this society as a friend. For they know that the Equitable Society is a society, not only in name, but in fact. And that they, the members, are the sole owners of this society, which is run for their benefit and theirs alone. Consequently, every day in the Equitable mailbox, there are letters from our members, the kind of letters a person writes to a good friend. Here's a letter from a widow, telling us how her Equitable Society policy stepped in to save her family from disaster. Here's one from a farmer asking our advice in financing the purchase of a piece of land. And here's one from the officer of a large corporation with a suggestion about our group insurance plan. Yes, in every mail we get pats on the back and friendly criticisms, problems to solve and suggestions to consider. And we firmly believe that these close contacts with our members are important in keeping the equitable society alert Progressive, future-minded, with life insurance policies exactly suited to present-day needs and with forward-looking investments that promote the prosperity of the entire country. Yes, by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now back to This Is Your FBI. Through the telephone transmitter which the Honolulu agent held out of the office window, Director Hoover listened to the exploding bombs which were taking a terrific toll of lives, leaving Honolulu and Pearl Harbor an inferno of smoke and flame, and turning battleships of the Pacific Fleet into a mass of twisted steel at the bottom of the bay. Then the agent came back on the line. Mr. Hoover, have you any special instructions? Put our emergency plans into operation at once. We'll receive further instructions shortly. Yes, sir. 
Operator, this is Mr. Hoover. Have a staff call issued immediately and have all members of the Bureau not on duty report for duty at once. Here's Mr. Hoover. I'd like a status report, gentlemen. Well, all employees here at Bureau Headquarters have reported for duty. I see. Special agents and employees of all field offices are now on duty and standing by. Well, from now on, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is on a 24-hour basis. You'll put our general plan of action into operation at once. And here are some further steps to take immediately. Give these priority over all other messages sent by teletype. That's all. <laughs> All special agents in charge. Contact all commercial airlines your district immediately. Request no Japanese, civilian, or diplomatic be permitted to travel by air. Hoover. Arrange immediately with all transportation companies your district to stop all travel by Japanese individuals on train, bus, or vessel. Hoover. Arrange immediately with all telephone and telegraph companies your district to discontinue all telephonic and telegraphic communications by Japanese to points outside the United States. Hoover. Advise all press associations immediately. Suspend all service to Japan and occupied China. Hoover. Contact all defense plants, transportation and communications companies, your district, and request them take prescribed steps to prevent sabotage. Hoover. Barely more than two hours after the first Japanese bombs rained down on Pearl Harbor, your FBI was fully mobilized, operating on a 24-hour basis, and with its prepared plan of action moving at top speed. Special agents had located and had under close surveillance those who, they had reason to believe, would try to sabotage the United States. Then there came chattering over the teletypes into every field office in the United States and Hawaii, this climactic order, which every agent was waiting for and eager to execute. Immediately arrest all Japanese individuals on A, B, and C lists. Also all other Japanese aliens on whom you have information indicating arrests necessary for best interest internal security this country. These are very urgent instructions we are receiving. How much longer do you think it will be safe to stay here? We are cleverly concealed. We will never be found. What's it? Grab that radio, Tom. Right. What is meaning of this outrage? We're special agents of the FBI. You're both under arrest. You're Saito Fuji? Yes. Are you interested in Oriental Antique? I'm a special agent of the FBI. You're under arrest. We'll take your suitcase full of dynamite along, too. In cities up and down the West Coast and all the way across the country to New York. And all through the night, the arrests went on. And they were still going on next day when Congress, in special session, formally declared war against Japan. This was quickly followed by other declarations against Germany and Italy. And the FBI was being rewarded for its years of preparations. At a railroad station in Dallas, Texas. All aboard. Just a minute, you. But the train is about to leave. It'll have to leave without you, Lockman. We're from the FBI. The back room of a bar in Cincinnati, Ohio. All right, stay where you are, everybody. What's the idea? We're agents of the FBI. You're all under arrest. In a cabin overlooking the Jersey coast. Drink to the floor. Stay where you are, all of you. The house is around us. We're special agents of the FBI. You're all under arrest. The roundup continued, and by nightfall of December 8th, 
scarcely 30 hours after Japan's sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Nearly 2,000 enemy aliens on the highly dangerous list had been arrested. And the war against espionage and sabotage was to continue, along with every other phase of the FBI's internal defense program until VE Day and VJ Day brought total victory to America and her allies. And when the end had come, Director J. Edgar Hoover said this. My co-workers throughout the Federal Bureau of Investigation and I are proud to be able to report that during the four long years of war, not one single act of enemy-directed sabotage was successfully carried out in this country. But the credit is not alone the FBI's. It belongs also to those local and state law enforcement officers of yours who worked faithfully and around the clock with us, and to the alertness and cooperation of you, the American citizen. Is there not something highly significant in that? By working side by side together in common cause, each forgetting self, the American people have won a great victory in war. Is not a victory in peace dependent on that same unity of mind and heart and purpose? Before you answer... Think a while of those 275,000 sons and husbands and brothers and sweethearts of yours lying under those little white crosses. And now, before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of the FBI, here's an important message about an unusual classroom in which adults are back at school. This week at the Equitable Society, I sat down in a classroom where grown-up men were going to school. The students in this class were ex-servicemen. In rank, they ranged from first-class privates and naval petty officers to colonels and commanders. One was a fighter pilot with a distinguished record. Another was a Marine, a veteran of many hard-fought landings on the islands of the Pacific. Before going into the service, all of them had been agents or field representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now they're taking what you might call a refresher course to bring them up to date on recent developments. You see, life insurance is one business that never stands still. Here in the Equitable Society, we are constantly finding ways to improve the many protective services we render to our three and a quarter million members. And this means that every Equitable Society representative must be well-trained, qualified on the subject of life insurance. Life insurance is their profession. And they must at all times be prepared to offer professional advice and assistance to Equitable Society members present and future. We of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States take particular pride in the men and women who have been chosen to represent us. It is due in a great measure to their conscientious efforts that we are able to say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Highway Hijackers. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. All other names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. 
Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Highway Hijackers. With opportunities for black market operations rapidly vanishing, the professional criminals who won distinction on that field of dishonor during the war are now carrying out their own programs of reconversion which is one of the reasons for the increase in robberies and hijackings over the country. The ink is barely dry on tonight's case, telling of your FBI's encounter with two criminals who discovered recently that a certain road in the southwest offered rich profits for highway robbery. A few miles inside New Mexico from the Arizona border, Marty Jennings and her husband, George, operate a tourist camp. But Marty does most of the operating because of her husband's ill health. It is shortly after dark now, and Marty enters the bedroom with a tray of supper. Here you are, darling. And I want you to eat every bite of it, too. Thanks, Marty. Did you take your medicine, honey? Yeah, sure. Whatever good that does. Does plenty. You start on your soup while it's hot. Marty... Don't you ever get tired waiting on me? I said start on that soup, young man. Fine husband I turned out to be, huh? You're going to be stubborn about it, are you? Thought you were marrying a he-man, didn't you? Who could take care of you. George. His health goes on the blink and he has to bring you way off out here in the desert. You have to do all the work. He lies up in bed most of the time and... Marty, why did you do it? Why don't you go back east where you were doing okay until George. I... George, I'm here because I want to be here. I love you more than anything in the world. And I'll never leave you. Thanks. <laughs> Sounds like new business in the office. Mm-hmm. You eat your supper, I'll be back after a while. All right. Good evening. What? Hello, Marty. You remember Mac here? Mm. How are you, Marty? Nick, what are you doing here? We come to see you. How did you know where I was? Well, after you'd done that run out, we did a little checking up. Heard you'd married yourself a sucker and come out here. Yeah. What's the matter? Ain't you glad to see us, Marty? Why did you come here and what do you want? We figure you owe us a little favor and we come here to collect. Nick, I don't want any more of that life I was mixed up in and you know it. Ah, oh, but Marty, Nick don't want How... to... Do the talking, Nick. There won't be any more talking, Nick. The only good break I ever got was a chance to play it straight with a guy like I'm married to. And nothing's going to get a chance to mess it up. They tell me he's got bad lungs. But he's going to get well out here. They also tell me that worry is the worst thing in the world for people with bad lungs.
bad lungs. What are you getting at? Mac and I are out here on business, and all we want is one of your cabins for headquarters. Now, look, Nick, I just got through telling and you And I that... just got through telling you that worry is bad for that husband of yours. Now, either we get the cabin, or he gets the whole story on you. Well? Marty, can I help you? George, you get right just back... Just a minute, lady. You say you had a cabin for us? Or not? Yes. We'll take care of you. It was nearing noon next day when a trailer caravan winding through the Arizona uplands began to approach the New Mexico border. A caravan of some of those families who, a few years ago, had trekked to California in search of relief from their wretched poverty. Okies, they were called. Today, thanks to years of good wages and war plants, they're rolling homeward in droves, for the first time in their lives, adequately fed and clothed, and carrying a few thousand dollars in savings, which, which, at last, to buy their dream, a piece of good land all their own. Most of them travel in caravans for mutual protection. But as this particular little caravan rolls along, Sarah Barlow doesn't feel too secure. I tell you, John, I just don't like traveling across country with all this money hid under the seat. Now, now, don't fret about it, Sarah. That's why everybody going home travels together like this, because it's safe that way. Uh, well, maybe you wouldn't feel so skittish about it if, well, if we wasn't the last in line. Oh, somebody's got to be last. Yeah, I suppose so, but... Just the same, I Now, wish that... stop your worrying about it. Just think we're going to be home in about three or four days. Mm. Home, Sarah. Kind of does something to you when you think about it, don't it? Mm, yes. Yes, sir, those old green hills are going to look good to us this time, Mother. Because instead of scratching around on top of them and going hungry, we're going to have a piece of rich land down in the valley good house. Then we can look up at them and see how pretty they are. Oh, it'll be wonderful, John. Just wonderful. But look at that car speeding around that curve, Sarah. But, why, that looks like the same one as passed a while back. Yeah. Look at them cutting over in front of us. But, John, they're waving to us to stop. There must be something wrong up ahead. And they're getting out. Yeah. What's wrong up ahead, mister? I say, what's the trouble? Look, John, they got pistols. Huh? All right, you, this is a stick. Oh, no. Give me your dough and make it fast. Oh, John. Be quiet, And don't try any stalling. Now, listen, I mister. I don't stall. I'm not stalling. Sure, we got money, but let me tell you something. Ah, shut up and hand it over. No, I won't, and I'm not telling you where it is either. All right, pal, you asked for it. No, no, wait, please don't. I'll, I'll tell you where the money is. Oh, Sarah. Mister, we worked years to save that money so we could buy it. <gasps> oh, no, no, no. Ah, no. shut up, lady. You get the same thing. Hurry it up, operator. Hello? Hello, FBI? Yes, Special Agent Yeager speaking. This is Sheriff Williams, Lordsburg, New Mexico. What's the trouble, Sheriff? Two men in a black sedan robbed a man and his wife a few hours ago just over the Arizona line Uh and disappeared back across the line with $10,000. $10,000? Yeah. They were the tail end car in one of those Oki caravans, money they'd been saving for years. Well, I've been wondering when this would start. There's been a lot in the papers about those caravans. One of the bandits knocked a man out with a gun, but the doctor here in Lordsburg passed him up all right. Well, where's the man now? The caravan's stopping here the rest of the day and night. The man and his wife are camping with him just outside of town. Good. We'll get over right away. That you, George? Yeah. How was the sunset? Huh? You went out to look at the sunset, George. Oh, oh yeah. That yeah, was beautiful. Well, Marty. Yeah. Those two men who rented a cabin here last night. 
What about them? Who are they? Well, how would I know? Their names are on the register over there. Well, what I meant was, well, did you talk with them at all? No, not much. They said they were from the east. They're looking over ranch properties, I think. Well, did they tell you that? Why, what's the matter? Well, rancher stopped by a little while ago on his way back from Lordsburg. Yeah. He said two bandits robbed a couple in an Oki caravan today just over the line in Arizona. They got away with over $10,000. Oh, that's terrible. Well, George, you don't think... All I'm thinking right now is that the two men in that cabin back there sure drove back here in an awful hurry this afternoon. Mr. and Ms. Barlow, these are Special Agents Yeager and Hickman of the FBI. Uh-huh. How do you do? Mr. Barlow, the sheriff tells me neither of you was able to give much of a description of the bandit. Well, what little I might have remembered, Mr. Yeager. I'm afraid the blow on my head knocked it out of me. And I was too upset to remember how they looked. Well, with John Hurt and all. Oh, yes, of course. But maybe one of you might recall how they talked. Well, they, they just talk tough, son. Well, did they have a western drawl? Or... Well, if you ask me, they sounded just like gangsters in a movie. That should help. Well, what good's that do you? That means they're outsiders who have moved in here for the express purpose of robbing the caravans. Well, then they must have a hideout somewhere in these parts. Exactly. And they're not running out after just one strike, Sheriff. But they might move on after the second. Yes. Meantime, we'll try to find that hideout. <laughs> George, I thought you'd gone to bed. Honey, honey, my hunch about those men was right. What? I had to find out, and I did. What have you done? Well, I slipped around outside their cabin a minute ago, and I heard them talking about plans for holding up a caravan. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to call the sheriff at Lord's... No, no, George, wait. Well, what for? You mustn't call the sheriff, George. Well, I... honey, those men are dangerous criminals. Oh, you can't call. Well, why not? There's something you don't understand. I... What? George, it's about them and me. Marty, Marty, what do you mean? I know those men, George. I know them from... Well, the days before I met you. Oh. That's why they came here. Well, Marty, you you mean you're mixed up with them in this thing they're doing? No. Well, then I, I don't get it, Marty. Look, darling, I... I told you there were some things in my past that weren't very pleasant that I could never talk about. Yeah, I know. Well, those men were part of that path. Marty, this is the present. You're, you're shielding those men, and I've got to know why. Okay. I used to go around with a man named Crandall. Don't ask me why. He was mixed up with these two out there. Yeah, yeah. A few months before I met you, Crandall was killed. They killed him. I have no proof, but I know they killed him. They tried to pin the crime on me. Well, how? They planted my fingerprints on a gun. The police arrested you? No, no, nobody was arrested. They just held that over me in case they were ever picked up for the crime. And they're holding it over you now? They threatened to tell you. They knew that you were sick and that I... I didn't want to upset you. Oh, baby. Baby. I didn't know what to do. Darling, darling, look, I, I love you. I don't care about whatever happened in the past. Are you sure? Sure. Now can I call the sheriff? I'll call him. Hang up that phone, Marty. What? Mac thought he saw this husband of yours snooping around, so I thought I'd better find out why. So you did? Yeah. Marty, I said for you to hang up that phone. Honey, let me have that phone. You oh, keep George. out of this. Let me have it. Okay, pump. Operator. You asked for Operator. it. Operator. No! <clears throat> now we'll hang up the phone. You've just heard the first half of the FBI file on the highway hijack. As you know, the action took place in New Mexico and Arizona, states renowned for starlit nights. But other stars, imaginary stars on maps, 
hold special interest for members of the Equitable Society. Let me tell you about them. Suppose you were to take a big map of the United States and start putting stars on every spot where funds of the Equitable Life Assurance Society are invested. Before long, every section of that map would be so covered with stars that you wouldn't be able to see the state boundaries or the names of cities and towns. Thousands of stars would point out farms, ranches, or plantations where Equitable Society dollars are helping to promote American agriculture. Thousands of other stars would indicate homes that are being purchased through the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. More stars would mark industrial plants, large and small, in which Equitable Society funds are now invested. There would be stars on steel mills and power plants, on railroads and textile mills, on coal mines and refineries. Yes, every single state would be covered with stars showing places that Equitable Society dollars are at work. Which goes to prove that the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has every right to use the last four words in its name. Of the United States. By serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. And now, back to the file on the Highway Hijackers. When there are no clear-cut clues to a criminal's identity, such as fingerprints, physical description, or even microscopic evidence that may be developed in a laboratory... The FBI agent is forced to improvise his own methods of ferreting out his quarry as he goes along. After interviewing the robbery victims at the caravan camp, Special Agents Yeager and Hickman are driving Sheriff Williams back to his office in Lordsburg. Well, what's your next move, Mr. Yeager? We'll start looking for the bandits' hideout. This is pretty big country. Well, since we're convinced that our men are Easterners, that'll narrow the search down some. How do you mean? Well, they wouldn't be likely to go in for roughing it in caves or hills if more homey comforts were available. Oh, I get you. Sheriff, Mm -hmm. what's the tourist camp situation around here? Well, Mr. Hickman, there's three or four between here and the Arizona line and a few more from there on to sunset that I know of. That'll do for a start. You really think they mean to strike again? I hardly believe they'd come all the way across the country for just one job. Otherwise, they'd have figured out a way of robbing a whole caravan at once for a big haul instead of just taking the tail-end car. That sounds reasonable. Uh, Mr. Yeager, here's my office right here. Oh, okay. What time are you aiming to start checking on the tourists? Right camp? now. Oh, tonight, huh? Well, every minute counts. We want to locate that hideout if we can before they strike again. What can I do to help? Well, right now, just stay where we can reach you. We may need a lot of help in a hurry. Oh, I'll be ready. George, George, darling, try to drink this. <laughs> Now, ain't that sweet? <laughs> Please, Nick, leave us alone. Look, the guy is going to be okay. I give him a very light drink. That's right, Paul. It's like what might, you might call a sample, you know. Next time he don't get off that easy. There'll be no next time. Now, look here, Marty. I... Hey, Nick, somebody's here. Somebody's where? Just drove up outside. Two guys. You stay in here, Mac. Okay, Nick. Marty, you go in the front office. What for? You run the joint, don't you? Things have got to look normal. Suppose it's the police. You've got to get rid of them without telling them anything. You understand? And if I don't? I get this gun, baby. And if it has to go off, George takes it first. Now get in there and play it straight. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I, I hope you're not looking for a cabin. Well, that's all right. We didn't want a cabin. No. Now, we're a special agents of the FBI. Oh. Did you hear anything about the highway robbery just over the line today? Yes, I did. A rancher stopped by and told us. Us? Uh, my husband. Oh. We're looking for two men who drove a black sedan. Have you rented a cabin today or yesterday or any time recently? No. Too? No, I haven't. 
perhaps your husband has, or maybe he's seen them. May I ask him? Well, I, I'd rather you didn't disturb him now. Uh, you see, he's in bed. Ah, well, I, I can understand, but it is rather important. Well, uh, my husband is ill. He's quite ill. No. He's in bed most of the time, and I handle all of the business. I see. Well, I, I'm very sorry, and sorry to have bothered you. Oh, that's all right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Nice going, Marty. You know who I was doing it for. Don't you worry, Nick. You're going to get yours soon enough. Maybe, but not out here. What do you mean? The way things had turned out, I decided to pull one more job tomorrow and head back east. Sheriff. Well, oh, morning, Mr. Yeager. What luck? None, I'm afraid. Yeah, I stayed on here all night hoping you'd call for help. I'm sorry, but Hickman and I covered every tourist camp and ranch house between here and Sunset, Arizona. I had every sheriff between here and Phoenix on the lookout. They haven't turned up anything yet. Yeah. I still think they're hiding out around here somewhere. But how are we going to smoke them out before they make another strike? Which they're just as apt to do today as not. If they figure things are getting too hot around here hey, for them. Wait a minute. Oh, what you thinking? What I should have been thinking before. Well, what's that? I think I've got the answer, Sheriff. But we're going to have to do some fast traveling to make it work. Well, I'm ready to go. And then I'll get Hickman and we'll get started. I'm right here, darling. Well, oh. oh, my my head. Oh, don't, darling, don't try to move. What what happened to that man? He's still here. Oh. Marty, what about the sheriff? I never got the chance to call. Well, look, we've got to get him tonight. Darling, it's no longer night. Huh? Hey, I really passed out. That's right, you did. What time is it? Almost noon. Hmm? Well, how's the patient? Keep out of here, please. Sorry, I got some business to attend to. Come on in, Mac. Okay. You heard my wife say to keep out of here? Look, sure. mister, I don't want to have no more trouble with you. Take care of him first, Mac. Right. What are you going to do? I don't get excited. We're just tying the guy up. Uh, you keep away from Take me. Take it easy. Keep away. You I... leave me alone. Hold it, Marty. You're next. No, let me go. You're getting a lucky break. You just tie you both up and get out of here. Caravan's coming about two miles back down the road, Nick. How many cars? Fourteen. Most of them got trailers. What's bringing up the rear? A car with a trailer. And the driver's the only one in the front seat. How many in the trailer? I couldn't see. All right. Move over, Mac. Let me take the wheel. Okay. We swing the car around the curve a little further and head it this way. Then when the caravan starts coming around, we'll count off 13 and move in. Number 12, Nick. Yep. And here comes 13. Next one's our baby, Nick. Better move the car across the road and block it. I know, I know. Here comes 14. Yeah. All right, you. This is a stick-up. A stick-up? Why, you dirty low... Shut dude. up. Around back and open that trailer door, Mac. Okay. We'll save you the trouble. What? Drop those guns, both of you. What the... Cover that man there, Bob. What's going on here? Well, you might call this a double stick-up, mister. Only our part of it is legal. The man at the wheel is the sheriff at Lordsburg. Sheriff? 
And we're special agents of the FBI. Come along with us. The roundup of the hijacking gang resulted in their ultimate trial and conviction. They were sentenced to serve 10 years in a federal penitentiary. With the end of gasoline rationing, and with auto travelers once more streaming over the highways of America, criminals have taken to the road again. But your FBI and your local and state law enforcement officers are determined to wage war against them day and night until the only ones for whom auto travel will be unsafe will be those who seek to make it unsafe for others. Before hearing about next week's thrilling case from FBI files, imagine for a moment that you're a kid again. It'll help you to understand a message from the Equitable Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I heard a young veteran talking about cellar doors. He was holding a picture of a white colonial house in his hand, and he said, You see that cellar door? Well, I used to slide down one like it when I was a kid. And now my kids are going to slide down one, too. You see, I lived in a house like that until I was ten years old, and I've always thought it was a swell old place. Well, after I got back from France last month, I looked around and was fortunate enough to find a new house very much like it. Of course, I had to have a mortgage, and I guess it was my lucky day, because on that same day... I heard about the Equitable Society's home ownership plan. Well, I signed up right away for an Equitable Assured Home Ownership Loan. So next week, you'll see me teaching my little girl how to slide down a cellar door. Well, you know, no matter how often we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States hear stories like that, we never grow tired of listening to them. After all, that's our business in the Equitable Society, helping to make dreams come true, helping ambitious men and women reach their goals, starting young married couples on the road to an assured future, helping fathers and mothers send their boys and girls to college, bringing peace and contentment to old age. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security, For you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sorrowful Swindler. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to service men and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and saying, inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time... For this is your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.